you look good. Thank but, you. You know, you've got, I've got 40 years on you, so. <laughs> okay, so I think first, it's recording right now, right? Okay, so first, yes. before we start, do you want to introduce yourself, kind of let us know what you're running for, what you've done in the past, and what you plan to do in the future? Sure. So um, my name is Karen Sylvester. I am running for the Conejo Valley Unified School District, CBUSD, Board of Education and Area 1. So Area 1 is primarily the Westlake portion of Thousand Oaks with some adjacent Thousand Oaks area. And this is the first time that the election is actually by district area. So this is all very new. And right now there's not a trustee who sits in this area. Um, what have I done? I've lived in the community for 20 years and I've spent the past 18 starting with my oldest when he started kindergarten at Westlake Hills in 2001. I started volunteering right alongside of him and uh, you know my first job if you will was to stuff the cubbies in Thursday afternoon kindergarten and then I managed to get promoted to room parent and ultimately president of the Westlake Hills PFA. So that's kind of the path I've taken from a parent leader and volunteer perspective. My kids that went on to Kalina Middle School and Westlake High School, and I was president of the PTSA at Westlake High School. So I've had a lot of school site roles on the executive board. About nine years ago, I started getting more involved at a district level and started attending uh, what we call DAC meetings, District Advisory Council meetings, first as a representative for Westlake Hills and later as a representative for Westlake High School. And that's when you start learning really what the makeup of this district is, because we are a unified school district. But uh, if you look at Westlake Hills versus some of the other elementary schools or, or even across the high schools, there's some significant differences. And the challenges and the opportunities really, really do vary by school site, particularly around the areas of parent engagement and ability to fundraise. Uh, currently, I sit on the Measure I Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. And as a complete aside and having nothing to do with the schools, I'm also a commissioner on the Thousand Oaks uh, Council on Aging. So this is a group that works with the city council on the needs of senior adults in the community. So completely different. So that's kind of my school experience. If you go back into my professional and business career, it's all been in in business and I've spent 15 years as a business consultant working with different organizations. I have an MBA from Harvard Business School, I have an undergraduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, really nice credentials that hang up in a wall upstairs, but I think the most important thing is that I have worked or did work for 15 years advising companies on everything from their strategic plan or their marketing plan to how they want to organize their customer service department to better serve customers. So I really come at it from those two sides, kind of the school and district knowledge, as well as the, the real business skills. Mm -hmm. so, that was a very long intro, sorry. That's totally perfect. Um, I guess what kind of drove you into that, into the position? Because I know you have that school experience and that business experience. What kind of was the turning point for you? To <laughs> that's a long question um, or a long answer. Because it really was sort of evolutionary to me. Um, I never really, um, one of the questions you guys provided in the guide, um, which got me thinking was, have I worked on other political campaigns? And the answer is yes. Four years ago, I worked with um, a woman who was running for city council. Uh, she was going up against two incumbents and there were two seats and she did not win, but she ran a great campaign and I was her treasurer. And then two years ago, I ran Cindy Goldberg's campaign for school board. So I had that taste of politics from the other side and thought, this is a great role for me. Like I'm, I'm actually a really good campaign manager and, and such. So the thought of actually being the candidate and being the one being recorded on Zoom um, wasn't necessarily what I had thought about. But as kind of time elapsed and I started really thinking about the skills and that I have and the background I could bring to it, I, it, it, it just, made complete sense to me that I could be a really good trustee. And I don't know how to say it without sounding like, you know, hey, I'd be a good trustee, but that is really what I thought. And I'm, you know, when I, I say we've lived in the community 20 years, we moved to this community 100% for the public schools. At the time I worked downtown, my husband worked in Hollywood. This was incredibly inconvenient, but we wanted our kids to go to the public schools. We wanted them to be part of the community 
And so now that my youngest has graduated, she just graduated this past June from Westlake High School, it just felt that this was the time to give back and to make sure that the experience my kids had, and all in all, I mean, it wasn't perfect, but they had a really good experience that other kids would be able to access their education and have achieved their success. So I think it was a combination of, you know, it's like my time and I, I've had the political experience enough to know what was involved. And I think I have a really good set of skills to be an effective trustee. And I just wanna say this was all before the pandemic hit. And I think that just kind of hit home that in today's world, it's even that much more important to, to know what you're doing and be able to be effective from the first day. Yes, and something justice in the classroom is very passionate about is our six proposals that have to do with equity and diversity and inclusion. And one of our key beliefs is that the education system is kind of the basis of these three things. So how has your campaign or the experience you've done in the past um, impacted this and promoted diversity and inclusion? So I have to say, and I, I mentioned this before, I launched my campaign in February. And the first thing you do is you say, what, what do I want to achieve? Like, what is my, I, I can talk about public education is important, but what is it I really want to achieve? What do I see as the vision for the school district? So I would answer your question as saying, my first two priorities, two out of the three are hundred percent focused on that. The first is educational excellence for all students and a recognition that education is not necessarily delivered in an equitable manner or shouldn't be delivered in an equitable manner. It need, no, sorry, scratch that. Education should not necessarily be in, delivered in an equal manner. It needs to be delivered in an equitable manner. And, you know, that for different groups of kids, that looks very, very different. And the way you would allocate your resources looks very, very different. The second one of my goals was really around the culture of the district and wanting, wanting a school district, wanting school sites, wanting classes to welcome and celebrate all kids, every kid, regardless of their background, regardless, regardless of their ethnicity, their race, their language, their sexual orientation, you name it, every kid should feel welcomed, they should feel celebrated for who they are. And those two things have formed the cornerstone of, in my campaign pre-pandemic. And if you ask me, are they still important? I'd say they're even more important today. And I think it's even more difficult to achieve what I've just outlined. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's very important in public schools because public schools do tend to have more a diverse base of students from different socioeconomic backgrounds. So how do you believe, because students come from different backgrounds and from different um, socioeconomic um, places, how do you believe you should make the school environment more inclusive? I mean, I think there's a lot of things that can and should be done. So I, I think at a minimum, and, and I don't wanna pare it back all of your six parts of the resolution, but I, I think you've hit and nailed pretty much all of it. But a lot of it is like in the younger grades, you know, making sure that the books that kids are reading reflect their own backgrounds or who they are, so they feel represented. Um, you know, in my day, any book I read or any book that was read to me, it was, you know, the, the mom, the dad, the, the two kids, all were white. The dad had a briefcase in his hand. The mom had an apron. I mean, the, you know, that is just not the reality of most kids in our district. And I think that the stuff they, they see should reflect what that reality is. Um, so, it, so I think it, it does start at a young age, and I think it does involve um, that type of thing. I think it involves teaching teachers how to handle some of the questions that in their inevitably come up and how to um, as well, and again, it's one of your resolutions, but how to that, how they themselves should model um, and kids should see reflected in them teachers who speak Spanish or teachers who are black or teachers who are Latino. So I, I do think it's, it's doing all of that. Um, you know, and, it, and it, it's, it's a very broad topic, the topic of inclusion, because what the other part is like students with disabilities and what does inclusion for that group look like? Because typically, that's been the group that's kind of the school with, and I don't know how it works at Oak Park, but in, in a lot of school sites in our district, it was, has traditionally been a school within a school. And the special ed kids were kind of off to the side and, and did their own thing. And that is evolving and, and evolving in a good way so that a lot of our students can 
go to more classes with general ed students, which I think has benefits on both sides. And they're being taught in ways that um, cater to their own skills and strengths, also benefiting our general ed students. So I think that's a whole other topic on inclusion, which I think is important. And then, you know, I, I, you hear these, these stories um, that kids are saying about um, bullying and, you know, racial comments. And, you know, I, I went and pulled my own kids and they're like, oh yeah, we hear that all, we hear that all the time. And, and that kind of stuff just can't be tolerated. So I think students need to be made very aware of it. I think assemblies and the more information you can disseminate and all these wonderful student-led groups like yourselves and diverse hair narrative. I mean, to me as an adult, I'm, I'm really amazed at just the inroads you guys have made. So. And I was actually going to lead into that. So as like a student-led organization, we really value like marginalizing all of those mar uh, sorry, applying <laughs> all of those marginalized voices and um, really creating a space for student voices. And how is your campaign or how is your work in general thought to amplify student voices within an education standpoint? Well, I, I think, and I've been really impressed with our district has done over the past couple of years in terms of student voices. I have, um, I've sat in site council. I've been on site council at Westlake High School for years. There are active students on site council. We have a student um, trustee, this is year two we're starting, who sits on the school board and um, their perspective and their, their um, opinions has been invaluable because I watch every single board meeting. Um, there's a, a SDAC, which is a new group that has formed in the past uh, couple of years at, um, within the Kineho Valley, which also amplifies student voices. So everywhere I turn, it, it feels like there is an ability to hear those voices. Emphasis on the word, you have to hear the voices and you have to listen to the voices. So I, I can only say as a trustee or as a prospective trustee, having conversations like this, I've had conversations with the diverse fair narrative folks. I had a conversation with the 805 resistance and, and just understanding where you're all coming from um, is just absolutely key. Yeah. So um, along with that, we, I'm trying to like figure out how to fit in the question into here, but um, we've covered a lot about equity and just creating an overall um, inclusive environment something that really stands out is how do educators respond to situations where racism is taking place in the classroom for example um, within the recent years there has been a rise in hate crimes towards the jewish community the muslim community the african-american community and like i've experienced that firsthand where i've seen it happen in the classroom how do you believe educators should and staff members should respond to this increase in hate crimes and let me say I'm Jewish. Um, so the rise in anti-Semitism for me, who grew up reading about reading books about the Holocaust and thinking this could never ever happen, and and just seeing some of the stuff that's going on is is highly disturbing. So um, that's just an aside. But you know, it goes back to training educators. I think when you start talking about race, it's a sensitive topic. It shouldn't be a sensitive topic, but often it is. And I think. I, I, I think most of our teachers really do have best interests in, 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 at heart, but when they hear something, they don't know how to react. And they often have a split second to react. And if you don't know what to say, you might let the moment pass because you don't want to wait, wait in. And I think it circles back to, I think you need to train um, educators and teachers and staff on how to to handle these moments and it's not glossing over it it's not sending the kid down to the office i think it's about having honest conversations and i don't think a lot of those conversations necessarily always take place um and i think it's i think it's fair to say that older people um older than you um we were kind of brought up that you didn't talk about race you know it, it you know it, it shouldn't matter um so it wasn't a, a big topic um in certain circles and, and i think we need to kind of come back to the th part that it is an important topic. And, and so in the classroom, especially in today's world, which is kind of can be pretty political and pretty divisive, teachers need to understand what they can and cannot say, what they should or should not say. And that gets back to training them. Mm -hmm. That's a very, that's a very important thing within the justice in the classroom, because one of our proposals is having equitable training for uh, 
educators to learn about um, how to respond to hate crimes, how to respond to racism, and with just implicit bias between educators and students when they're teaching history, English, or even math. Yes. It exists in every single sphere of education. You know, I honestly, uh, up until the past few months, I've not really had to do a lot of reckoning with myself or really think deep thoughts about, um, you know, I, I would tell you, I'm not a racist, yet I've been advantaged by, you know, many things in my life that I don't even think about or, or even really acknowledge. Um, and I, I think where your group um, and a lot of the other student groups has really amplified this message and, and has caused me to really think about it. So um, I, 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 I applaud you guys, I really do. Thank you so much. So um, I think my last question would be like, um, if you need me to go through the six proposals, I can, but what is the <laughs> six proposal that sticks out the most to you? Okay, I'm, I'm cheating on this answer because I, I, I saw the question, so I went back and I looked. And as you guys yourself acknowledge, they are pretty interconnected. So I'd be like, that one's important, ooh, but that one's important, ooh, you can't do that one without that one. So I'm, here's how I'm going to answer that. And I'm going to answer it in two ways. And the first is looking back over, let's say, the past 18 years, where, as I've said, I've spent as a parent leader, what resonates with me and what, ha what has my self-reflection led to? And I think whether it was the PTA or the or the district advisory council, or I was on the canal council, I've been involved in nominating committees. And as a nominated committee, you sit and you put together a slate of offices, officers, excuse me. And I can tell you as part of a nominating committee, and I've probably done it five or six times, I think about, I need some parents from this school and I need some representation here. And I want parents of younger kids and parents of older kids. Not once did I ever say, we need a Latino parent, or we need a black parent or an Asian parent. And I'm not saying everyone who stepped up was, was white, but it was not mindful. It was just um, done without thinking about it. So from a personal standpoint, everything I've done up to here, that's what resonated with me. But then I'll answer it, okay, moving forward as a trustee, what would resonate? And I think, because and I've mentioned this a few times, the training to me is the most, it, it's easy to, it's not easy. It could be done in a more immediate uh, time frame. It would have an immediate impact. I love changing the curriculum, but we know there is a process there. Much as you all want to get it done yesterday, there is a process and that's going to take a while. So I think going forward as a trustee, I have to put student needs first. And to me, what would benefit students would be the training of their teachers. So that's what I'm going to answer your question, because I found it kind of hard to just pick one. Pick one, yeah. I, I don't even think I can. Um, <laughs> yeah, so is there anything like you want to include about your campaign or anything you want to tell the Justice in the Classroom platform in general? I mean, I, as I said, I think you guys, I, I have three kids of my own. So I've had the conversations around the kitchen table, and, you know, they've, they're kind of training me. Um, and I appreciate from my own kids and I appreciate hearing it from, from you guys and the diverse fire narrative folks. And the fact that at the last school board meeting, the resolution was unanimously passed and not a lot of things in our district get unanimously passed. And the equity task force, which has been, I guess, um, in progress for a little while also got passed. And there are student voices on that as well, as well as some people I know. So I think it's gonna be a great committee. Um, and the only thing I would say as a trustee, while it's nice to have a resolution and while it's nice to have a task force, if that's all you got, then that you haven't really accomplished that much. So I would pledge to make sure that that resolution is not just a piece of paper and that any recommendations that the task force come up with are not merely recommendations, but that they turn into policy and can be implemented. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for coming today. It's honestly such an honor to see someone who's accomplished so much within education as a parent and as a leader within our community. So thank you so much for having me today. Well, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. And, and I would welcome anyone who wants to reach out and talk to me directly. You have my email. My um, website is Sylvester number four. Uh, school board, Sylvester Four School Board .com. Um, If you got people who want to walk neighborhoods and distribute literature.
furniture or phone bank, we are really happy to have anybody help. So we're getting down to the wire at this point. But I appreciate your time and I do appreciate all the work your group has done. You guys are a very impressive group. You should all feel really, really good about yourselves. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna stop.